is going to get returned by Sherrod. And he takes a big hit out of the 25-yard line. Keen. Pressure. Throws. Intercepted. Marcus Ratcliffe picked him off. And he gets tackled by Malik Sherrod. Behind Maiden. Maiden's keeping it. Maiden gets around the edge. He's got nothing but green grass. Jalen Maiden. Touchdown Aztecs. Armstead with a push in the back. And he breaks the plane. His first kick tonight from the right half. And no problem. Career high four field goals for Brown. Maiden wants to throw. Maiden caught. Touchdown. Leo Kemp. The first of his career. Brady Hope going out with a win. And the old oil can is coming back to San Diego. Hey, boy, you too crazy. You gotta give coach a game ball. All right, all right, all right, Aztec Nation. We want to thank you all for joining us today. This is the Sons of Montezuma podcast, and I am your host, Mateo. You can find me at Mateo San Diego on Twitter, and you can find us at Sons of Monty on Twitter, of course, all over social media, on Instagram, Facebook, all those good things. And before you get any further, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. This is uh, many seasons in the making for us here at Sons of Montezuma. And today, today's a big day, so we're gonna get right into it. Joining me up above is, well, he's protecting our borders from sea to shining James, sea. James, of course, it James, is K5 James. James. What's up, James? How you doing? Oh, I'm feeling great today, man. Got some got some good news, so I'm excited. Yes, sir. It's not a, it's not a routine day, so, you know, bear with us as we get through all our particulars. And of course, joining us, San Diego State, baby. He changed his, his caption up at the top is no longer we, we put the we put the weapons away what's going on daniel, daniel dirt ball dan, dan is in the house good to see you dan, daniel, what's up dude dan, very very excited <laughs> okay james tell me when we were watching the fresno state game and it was third quarter and we were up big did you hear dan's voice in your ear saying finish him finish him did you hear him that time <laughs> no i did not hear him then so I think that was all you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about it, Dan, because, you know, it was a year ago. And if, if you guys had, weren't there on Saturday, the Aztecs beat Fresno State to get the oil can back, the old oil can, and uh, exercise some demons. You know, we, we ended the season giving Brady Hoke his flowers. You know, everything kind of shifted a little bit and everybody was really happy to to kind of like, okay, gracefully give him his honor and, 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 and say goodbye, as you guys saw in the intro. But that's over with now, guys, and I'm ready to turn the page. And today the Aztecs officially did turn the page. They signed, well, they're going to make it official tomorrow. Their 20th head coach in Aztecs football history, and that is... Sean Lewis, offensive coordinator. Well, used to be offensive coordinator at Colorado. Guys, as the people start getting into the live stream, they're excited. Everybody wants to know what's going on with Sean Lewis. This was a name that wasn't on my top five list. I don't know if it was on Dan's top five list. J James, was it on yours? Yeah, he was on mine. Okay. Well, sneaky, yeah. sneaky. So since he was on your list, he was on your list, you get first down on Sean Lewis, hired as the, as the 20th head coach in Aztec football history. Give us your initial thoughts. Man, he kind of, uh, when we came up with that list, I kind of named the three things I was looking for. Under 50, uh, prior head coaching experience at a lower level, like not a high money power five school, and then uh, an offensive guy, an offensive mind. And he pretty much nailed all three of those for me. And just kind of when you take, I remember when the when Colorado had all that hype and Coach Prime had all that hype at the beginning of the season, I would text you guys about it and like, man, that offense is impressive. It's impressive the job that the offensive line coach has done to give them enough 
protection because that was one of the worst offensive lines of football last year. Um, and then just the the way the offense performed, I was like, man, that that's looking like a brilliant hire bringing him over from Kent State. Not thinking in a million years that we'd be sitting here today with that guy as the the new leader of our program. So I'm I'm super stoked for it, man. He's a he's a brilliant offensive mind. He's not a guy that's just going to go out there and throw the ball over the place. He likes to run the ball too. So uh, if, if you're a fan of offense, I think uh, we have a lot of fun days ahead of us. Okay. All right. All right. Dan, you want to give your initial thoughts after hearing James a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I don't know why. I, I guess I didn't even think of him or I didn't really know the situation too well to, to list him. But after we made our list, like I would see his name popping up at other jobs. It's kind of crazy how quiet his name was towards the San Diego State job. We had all these other names that are getting leaked, but – um, nothing regarding him. And um, to me, like my, my like, guy I wanted was Cliff Kingsbury. But it's, there, for me, it's a similar type hire, honestly. Um, you know, an offensive guru, guru, a young guy, good looking dude, you know, like something that's going to add some, um, you know, just some bring some fire, some excitement. Yo, 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 yo. I think he could, uh, <laughs> I think he could help with, you know, raise some money and, get people to the stadium, just, you know, just something completely opposite than what we have currently. And that's what I was really looking for. I wanted the wow factor. And I think, I think there is a bit of that. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I give you a little hard time for that, for that good looking comment, but no, it is, it is true. I mean, it's a completely different head coach. Uh, you know, we're used to obviously Brady Hope, Rocky Long with this new infusion, like James said, somebody under, under 50, he's definitely under that. And, you know, when you guys put me on to some of these videos and seeing the energy, the enthusiasm, man, it's all there. Okay, guys, before we get to all your comments, let's just get a, a, a little basic info about who the Aztecs just hired, right? Because, you know, all, all the information is there. He's 37 years old. He, uh, well, he played in Wisconsin. He was a tight end. Big dude. Big, big dude. So he, he, he's an imposing presence. Of course, his uh, coaching career, if if we want to go back, um, uh, you know, you can go back to, to the high school ranks, you know, some of the earlier jobs, Akron. But the, the first one that kind of jumps off, and I believe Kurt Kenny, who, who reported the official news today for the UT, you know, he was on that Eastern Illinois team, <laughs> that Eastern Illinois team we all remember that uh, took us to to the woodshed. And that was, of, of course, with Dino Babers as head coach, right? Yeah. yeah, he's a Dino Babers disciple, dude. So that's kind of like a name to keep an eye on. He might be, could possibly could be a member of the staff going forward. So I, I heard that. And, you know, our last episode, any of you guys, you know, now it's, it's a, the last episode is completely obsolete now. We were talking about, you know, some of the two candidates. Coach Tony White was one of them. And you were jumping in. And you were like, dang it. Should have mentioned, you know, Tony White, if he would have been hired, he could have brought, you know, maybe a po possible Dino Babers as OC. But now th there's still that connection there between Dino Babers and, of course, Sean Lewis. So, I mean, did, when you take that into account, OK, he was at Eastern Illinois. So there's some familiarity. There's some connections there. Maybe they, you know, asked Dino Babers if they were obviously being thorough in in their search. And then he goes to bowl. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. No, uh, I know. Like James, thinking he, he might come on as like an offensive coordinator or something. But honestly, the offensive coordinator at Kent that was there when um, Lewis is there is, is available, um, and it probably makes sense. They had some, you know, outstanding offenses there. He ended up going to Minnesota as a tight ends coach, and it didn't work out there. But he's he's available now. Um, I mean, obviously, Dino Babers would be cool. I just think it's probably not not very likely. No, I would I would agree on that. I mean, it's it's nice to have that connection though, that San Diego connection. I'm sure he vouched for him. Um, okay, so then from Eastern Illinois, went to Bowling Green, wide receivers coach, quarterback coach, then to Syracuse once again, right? I think he followed Dino Babers there as well, um, co OC and quarterback coach. Then he got his opportunity at Kent State, and he was there for four years. Now tell me, guys, his job there at Kent State. Okay, I was giving you guys a little pushback earlier when we heard the news. <laughs> and, and, you know, if you just look at the stats, you look at the numbers, 
the win loss record is not going to it's not going to impress you when you look at the numbers. And initially you see that and you're like, oh, OK, it's a Mac team like the numbers didn't really wow you. They OK, they went to the potato bowl. James, you kind of you kind of put me in my place a little bit. So why should his time at Kent State for those out there that may be scratching their head like Kent State? OK, talk us down off that ledge. What did he do at Kent State that stood out to you so much? I'll let uh, Dan hit the points he brought up in our little text chat earlier, but I'll just first talk about Kent State is like one of the most difficult programs in the country to try to win um, because they're a, a lower resource program, even in the MAC. So not only and and because of that, they have a tough schedule every year. They have body body bag games pretty much two or three a year that are almost guaranteed losses. I'm talking about like playing Georgia and Alabama and teams like that. So um, it's a tough place to play, and they need those games just for that football program and the athletic department to survive, pretty much. So it's like a kind of like a coaching graveyard, man. There's there haven't been many guys that have been successful there. And then um, also, you, you want to talk about like the overall win loss record. I mean, look at when we hired Brady Hope the first time. I think he barely had a 500 record when he came from Ball State. So it's it's not like it's it's not an indication of how good of a coach he is. Just for the fact that he was only there for four or five years. I forgot how many exactly. And, uh, you know, he initially took over a very bad program. So there's kind of like that learning curve, um, trying to get your guys in, get your system installed. So uh, to me, his overall win-loss record is not a huge deal, as long as there was kind of like progression. And uh, I'll let Dan hit on the points he brought up. So he was 24 and 31, Dan, overall. But what, what stood out to you in his time at Kent State? <sighs> Well, okay, so he has our only bowl game win. They've been to a bowl. The history of the program since it started, like, in 1920. They've been to four bowl games. He has two of them. Um, when he came to the to Kent State, they were 2-10. and 10. When he left, they were 0-11 this last year. Um, so he did things like that at that school that's, that hasn't been done. I think he had two seven-win seasons um, as well, which is, I think, he, maybe one other time in their history they had another seven-win season. Mm -hmm. So, like, we can't – I can't, like, can't state it enough about how poor or how difficult that job is. And um, that's why when he had a chance to get out, he probably knew he hit his limits there, and they took that. That's why he took that OC job with, with Colorado. I love that. Uh, what was that tweet? I think it was from Aztec killing him. He was like, "the the fact that Kent State's biggest football, you know, achievement is the fact that they they didn't have Antonio Gates playing football when he was there at Kent State." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that really highlights the the afterthought of what Kent State is as a program out there, and and the fact that he he did have some success out there. I mean that that's that is pretty big. So, okay. Then from Kent State, after a couple of years there, he made this move with Coach Prime at Colorado. And it was, you know, obviously we all saw, saw what Coach Prime did this past year and where it's ended. And so that's what kind of like, how do you say, it, it, this hire to me is, is a very interesting hire on just that fact alone because – Okay, all of the speculation, all the dumb stuff that kind of came out on his name this season throughout just the the, the kind of circus atmosphere that it's been in Colorado. And I mean, come on, we I was caught up in the hype earlier this year, seeing how they came out against TCU and the success they were having. But then when you obviously look at the full season and you kind of see the antics and, and kind of how the progression on, on well, not even progression, just how, how the team is really really imploded um you know all the all like i said all the dumb stuff thrown out there about him and his time there and the the power struggle you know when you look at coach uh you know lewis he, he definitely uses that word alpha a lot right <laughs> it's like this whole attitude so just right off the bat you think of those two personalities that have to work together in in the same uh you know offices and and with the team it just may have been too too big for those offices, but 
I mean, do you guys have any thoughts about that? Because I mean, like I said, all all those all those dumb things that kind of came out. It, it was surprising to me that this hire was made, despite the fact that the stuff was completely ridiculous. It seemed like, but I wouldn't have thought that that SDU, SDSU would have even you know gone around that type of a of a situation. Uh, but they did, and you know, it was a surprise to me. Obviously, not to you, James. I think um, a, a lot of it has to do with his uh, his kind of cachet he has. He's pretty well respected around college football, and everybody kind of saw the off the field shenanigans. I mean, say what you will about the hype. I, I'm a big, I'm as big a Dion hater as there is in terms of his him coaching. I love him as a player, but his coaching style, I, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, but still, it's still a pretty good turnaround, man. They were one of the worst teams in college football last year, and they still won four games. You know, it's it, the hype got insane earlier in the season when they beat TCU, who turned out to be not a very good team this year. Yeah. Um, so uh, that being said, the offense was still impressive when he was the guy running the offense. And that's, I'm sure, it, stuff's starting to come out now. There's kind of there may have been some issues with because Deion's son was a quarterback, like Deion wanted the offense run a certain way. And that might have led to why he got demoted. Um, and, and he's got a history of, he, like I said earlier, he likes to run the ball. And it didn't seem like uh, there was much of an appetite to run the ball in Colorado. So I think that was part of it as well. So, I, you know, I, I think it's smart on Wick JD to kind of look uh, beyond all the off, off the field shenanigans and kind of look at the, the job the guy has done at a coach pretty much every stop he's been. Dan, making this hire, what else did it speak to you kind of piggyback off of what James said as far as from San Diego State standpoint? I know they're going to make the press conference tomorrow and we're really going to hear from JD a, a little bit more on his thought process and making this hire. But initially, what, what did that communicate to you? You know, like when uh, JD initially said that the side of the ball really didn't matter about from they're going to look at both sides of the ball for coaching purposes. I he said that, but I think he preferred he wanted an offensive guy. He just wanted to look like he was limiting the pool too much. Um, and I'm ready for it. And I think like most of our fans are ready for it. Uh, he's going to bring an offense and an excitement that man that. It's going to be like the greatest show on turf type thing, you know, <laughs> and it's going to be up and down the field and it's going to be fun to watch. And you need that for the stadium. You need it for the fan base and you need something polar opposite than what what's currently. And that's like bringing a younger guy, bringing someone with some energy, some passion. And man, and and for that, I think they nailed it. And one, one thing that you got to remember is points per game. Colorado last year was 15. This year, when he was off the corner, it was 33. I mean, they more than doubled the points per game in, in one year. Um, so he was he, he did really good. I know there there's issues about his quarterback and Dion. And I, when I when you look from it from afar, you look about it when you look at it looking back, it's kind of a weird situation to, for him to get himself into, anyways. Um, you're gonna go coach. Um, bring a new offense to the quarterback, to the head coach's son under a Hall of Fame player who has a, a, an enormous ego, you know, um, and you're a young guy too. So the, just the the dynamic of being at Colorado um, was pretty strange. I'm surprised he, he, he took that job in the first place. Yeah, just listening to some of those uh, early interviews, they him and Dion didn't really have any kind of relationship. It was just kind of through a mutual mutual friendship he says so i mean that yeah i mean you, you took a big big risk out there just to get into some of the comments on uh, ec preps uh i believe he was saying he was coming off a de uh, demotion of course and he turned down the notre dame offensive coordinator spot to go out there to colorado so uh wasn't sure about that but that, that's definitely very interesting if if that is the case okay okay well, we want to thank everybody for joining here seeing you guys all the all the comments Okay, all right, let's see. Hmm, who, who, what, what are we looking at? Okay, so all these commits that have, well, backed out of Colorado, guys. I know there's a lot of speculation on, okay, well, it, is that part of maybe him being able to bring over a quarterback? Is, is that obviously one of the, the highlights 
in your guys' mind is that being able to get a quarterback. I, I think that shift in the culture was something we were definitely hoping for. And I, I think JD, JD was looking at that as well. Any thoughts on, on any of these quarterbacks? I'm seeing Robbie Casillas. Well, uh, a three-star quarterback, Danny O'Neill from Indiana, could could join Coach Lewis here in SD. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, he, he decommitted a, a yesterday. Um, I know, like, he might have some other options. But, I mean, it's for me, it's it's a cherry on the top. That's pretty short-term thinking. Um, we're always going to be able to get quarterbacks. We'll get some – we'll probably get a pretty quality quarterback even in the transfer portal. But, yeah, I mean, if we could get – a, a good recruit that was close to four stars and he was committed to, to Colorado and he wants to come to San Diego. And I watched some of the video on him. He looks pretty great. Honestly, he really does. But, you know, I'm, I'm more happy just to have Sean Lewis in, in his like offensive, offensive acumen than more than just a high school quarterback. I like this. Clayton Yiko, as to his recruiting, his top two receivers at Kent State ended up transferring to Penn State and uh north carolina where, where they dominated and that was after he left kent state so you know i know some of you in the chat are asking about his recruiting um you know what is that going to be like he's not necessarily a west coast guy though right i mean I, I know that was something they were they were supposedly focusing in on do, do you guys think that's going to be uh any any kind of a not i don't want to say struggle but just something he'll have to get acclimated to the west coast He'll have the uh, the coordinators. He'll. I'm not worried about it. And honestly, if you're going to say one thing about him, and I don't want to say this too much because I love recruiting, uh, but I think he lowers the need to have the higher recruits just based off his system. Mm. I think um, he could do more with less than most coaches can. Just honestly, just because of the offensive system and how much uh, pressure it puts on the other team's defense. Yeah, I think that's a. Uh... I think his staff will deal with that. Um, you know, Brady didn't have a whole lot of West Coast ties. I mean, he was the West Coast recruiter for Michigan uh, while well, he was the defensive line coach there. And, you know, he coached at Oregon State. But it's not like he was a dyed in the wool West Coast guy. So you just kind of, he'll hire some guys on the staff. He'll probably keep some of the current staff on. And he'll just kind of focus on getting more West Coast guys, guys familiar with the high school coaches in the area and the San Diego, L.A. area, Orange County. And that's kind of what will plug him in. And once and I'm sure he's going to go around and do the tour of all the high schools like all new coaches do when they come around. So I, I'm not too worried about that. He's a pretty good, engaging guy, it seems like, from the interviews I've seen of him. So I, I don't think it'll take him long to get acclimated to the, the coaches around here and, and the local recruiting base. Okay. All right. All right. Some somebody else, Rich, asking, can we bring Mikey Schmidt back to coach the O line? That, that'll be interesting. I, I'm sure there's some crossover there. Of course, you know, talking about Syracuse and. Some of those. I, I have a feeling he's going to bring his guy from Colorado, that uh, O'Bailey, um, and, and I, I think O'Bailey did a good job. I, I know they gave up a ton of sacks this year, but part of that was just the the lack of talent on the team, and just the it seemed like the desire for. A certain co coach's son to be the star of the show the whole time so i think that kind of affected their game plan offense offensively and their ability to kind of protect the quarterback by running the ball a little more things like that so i i think he did a solid job and he did a really good job at kent state when he was their offensive line coach so i, I wouldn't be disappointed if he brings him along okay okay eddie O, oh, coach prime put the ferrari in the garage Sean Lewis and brought out the minivan. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was interesting to see see uh, Colorado's demise this season, and, and you know you can't help but credit credit their success, at least a lot of their success. Okay, let's see, let's see. Hmm, 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 hmm. Okay, Joey. Hey, fellas, watching from the hospital with my dad. Can you say a prayer for him, please? He has cancerous. Oh, come on, Joey. <laughs> if that is true. If that is true, I see people giving the heart the, and, and the prayer emoji. If that is true, Joey, we send our prayers out. It better be true. It's not, it's not something to play around with. But, okay, Rick Torado, per UT, quarterback recruited by Sean Lewis, decommits from Colorado. Maybe he comes to SDSU. Okay, well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Whew. Okay, guys, how we feeling? How we feeling? I, I want to address something when it comes to 
San Diego State internally because you know one of the comments I got out there was okay JD's been been lazy with his hires got a lot of pushback against this hire from one in particular individual and you know when I saw the press conference from JD and it was the exit press conference with Coach Oak yeah it, it was it was really interesting to me and I think it speaks volumes with this hire um, you know with, when JD came in to back at least back to San Diego State as, as Dan gets unfrozen. When he came back here to San Diego State, I mean, you're talking about coming into a situation where you got Brian Dutcher at basketball in the, in the top two sports, right? Brian Dutcher taking over for Steve Fisher at basketball. Then you got Rocky Long, who is absolutely revered, you know? Um, so there really wasn't many big hires he had to do. Everything was stable and in place. Um, you know, it's just man managing that situation. And, and obviously, um, we're here at this point. When that hire made that, when Rocky Long made that hire down to, uh, to Brady Hoke, I mean, that was definitely a handoff hire. So I, I want to make sure everybody understands, you know, it's not a matter of being lazy at all. You know, we had our culture in place. And now, you know, to see this, this is JD's hire. Like, don't make any mistake. This is a, a definite change in what we're used to seeing here at San Diego State. So if there's any question, any kind of comments or, or you know, any kind of uh, negativity coming around about that, uh, man, you really need to check yourself. I mean, this is a completely different hire than what I expected for sure. Yeah, man, I, I know you can make that argument, I guess, about some of the Olympic sports and the non-revenue sports. But in terms of like the, the big two money making sports, this is the first chance he's really had at making a hire because, um, you know, it was already decided that Dutcher was going to take over for Fisher. And it was pretty much decided, not officially, that Hoke was going to take over Long if Long left. So uh, I, it's, I, I think this is the first hire we can really judge him. We'll see how it goes. I, I have a feeling it's going to work out great, but I guess, we'll, I mean, everything's wait and see you never know they could have hired you know freaking uh andy reed and we still have to wait and see <laughs> but uh yeah so i, I think he, it's a little early to say you know he's he's made lazy hires or bad hires or whatever because this is really the first hire he's really had to make this is the first legitimate coaching search they've done since brady hook was hired the first time so yeah i think it's a little too early to make those kind of comments about jd wicker as an ad and you know there was uh, there was some curiosity to me because okay with this new hire, Oscar Herrera is asking, is there a chance with the new football coach? Yeah, he's gonna bring in, uh, he's gonna bring in his staff. He's gonna bring in his guys who he trusts, who he feels comfortable running his system. So you know this is gonna be a very very big change on the Mesa. Okay, while we are waiting for Dan, I know we put out there that we have two Aztecs for life joining us tonight. So hopefully, uh. Hopefully we'll, we'll get them ready. And uh, man, I'm really excited because I, I've been wanting to reach out to, to both of these guys for a little while. And I think today and moving forward, I mean, it, it's kind of like the perfect, perfect situation, perfect timing to to bring in our next guest who we have here. And, and hopefully you guys get your questions ready. And we are talking about two Aztecs for life. And they are literally Aztecs, even in their coaching ranks. We are talking about one. Mr. Freddie Dunkel, the head coach there at Montgomery High Aztecs. How are you doing, Freddie? I see you. There you go. How are you doing, man? Doing well, doing well. How are you guys? Good, man. Good. Great. Good. It's great to have you on. Great to have you on. And, of course, his uh, a longtime offensive coordinator out there at, at Montgomery as well, none other than Mr. DeMarco Sampson. Welcome to the show, guys. How thank you. you thank you. Thank you. Doing good. Doing good. Getting over a little cold, but I'm, I'm doing good. It's going around. I know, man. A lot, of, a, lot, a lot of things going around, but we are feeling good today. How are you guys feeling, Freddie? I know, uh, you know, as a as a head coach, this is something that uh, it's not always easy. And of course, you guys know they're on the Mesa. This is a big change, big change from what we've seen for, man, over a decade. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of parts that go into it. You know, the coaching is one part, but you have to think about what the school is involved with as far as marketing and, and as far as paying coaches and now with the NIL, dealing with having to pay players. 
um, it's a reality that they have to deal with. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the players play and the coaches coach, and we all got to be working together along with the university. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. DeMarco, before you answer, man, it looks like we got, a, we got a little bit of a mutual friend down here in the chat. Mr. Uh, Eddie, Eddie Orjo. I don't know. I don't okay. Know Eddie Or <laughs> Yeah. What's up, Ed? Um, yeah, it's kind of the same, you know, like, uh, we were, we were a part of several, well, not several, a couple of coaching changes with, um, coach Kraft and then, um, Chuck Long, um, and then finally Brady, um, so coaching changes, I mean, it's hard. As, as long as the next coach doesn't lose the team when they come in, I think I think you know, most of them do pretty good. Any thoughts you guys seen on on uh, his coaching style? Because man, when you see some of those clips, I mean, it's a it's a high motor, high energy. I mean, it, it's very much. Uh, uh, it seems like a like a lot of no nonsense. Like you're gonna win your position battles, and and it's gonna be. Just the energy, the speed, you know, everybody talks about the speed of the offense, but just the way he communicates as well to the team. I mean, it's it's on the go nonstop. Yeah. Okay, you well, I mean, for 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 uh, you know, for me being an OC myself, um you 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 always kind of want to have that tempo, you know. And um you just don't want to get carried away with the tempo. And and I did notice that a lot of the you know during the year, um he would kind of, you know, slow his team down at certain points to kind of keep them balanced. So, I mean, I think that's a good point. That's a good um, trait that he has as an offensive coordinator. Yeah, def defensively, you know, I coach the defense at Hungarian. Defensively, a no-huddle offense does put a lot of stress on the defense, um, having to line up and, and, and get your calls in. And so that does create – Oh no! Uh -oh. <laughs> we'll see you back in a, We'll see you back in a second. Oh, there he is! There he is! I see him. I see him. All right. As you as you were saying, as you were saying, <laughs> uh, just mentioning that it's it's difficult to cover an offense that um, is always on the ball and and is quick to get their plays in and, and get them going. Um, dealing with the substitutions, um, dealing with the different packages that they they're allowed to have, um, puts the defense in a rough spot. Okay. Yeah, and as a, a defensive guy, that's got to kind of affect you as well, calling your defense, because your offense, if they're successful, it's great because you score, but also they score quickly, so your defense doesn't get much of a break. So that's got to be rougher on you as a defensive guy as well, right, with the, that kind of up-tempo offense on your side? Yeah, I mean, it could go both ways. You can get up and score by a couple point touchdowns and be up, or you can look at the clock and there's three minutes off and you're down by 14. You know, so it can go both ways. Um, but again, ball it goes down to football, you know, ball security, blocking, tackling. Um, off the, your offense is your best defense. So as long as they're on the field and the defense is on the sideline, then that's that's ideal. OK, OK, I'm reading some of these comments, guys. Everybody's giving you a lot of uh, fellow fellow Castle Park Trojan love in the comments, man. What's going on here? What's going CP on mob, here? CP mob. <laughs> <laughs> the jq daddy freddie and demarco nice okay okay joey joey trelezzi i think i said his name right demarco was my favorite aztec is it true he has six toes and that's how he ran such crisp routes <laughs> <laughs> no no man <laughs> Well, I don't know how many toes Dion has, man. I, I don't know, but you know, he, he, he's light on his foot, quick on his feet, man. Right <laughs> now, you know, um, our strength and conditioning when when um, when Coach Holt got there, he brought in Aaron Wellman. Yeah, and Aaron Wellman was was good at like you know, agilities and core strength. Uh, he didn't really he didn't really want big big bulky guys, you know. He just wanted more explosive guys. It was more of it was more of the attitude that um, they trained us for, you know. Yeah, I think that's a, a kind of underrated thing we got to think about too is uh, strength and conditioning and what guy he's going to bring in because that's kind of like the he's almost like another head coach, right? In, yeah. in terms of being part of the program, he's kind of with the guys with you guys more than anybody. It seems like. Heck yeah, um, we used to. Uh, we used to call it Wellmanized. You know, when guys would come in, they would like 
they would come in like with like deer in the headlights. And then after the first semester of being one with eyes, it was, <laughs> you know, it, it was a totally different animal. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I guess that's another thing we got to watch for this new, when he puts together this new staff is yeah. who he brings in to be the strength and conditioning guy, whether he keeps Hall around or brings in his own guy, yeah. that'll be something to watch. Yeah. And that, that's what I bring, uh, you know, to all those comments out there. I mean, this is going to be, Really, really a huge change out there on the Mason, no matter how, no matter how those things work out, no matter how those things work out. Eddie O says, just so you know, DeMarco, you are part of the second highest ranked class at STSU in the 2000s. Now, with that being said, he says, this style of offense, how do you think it impacts recruiting? Uh, I think you'll get. I think it'll it'll be it'll be good for uh, you know the guys on the outside, the flankers, the split ends. Um, just because coming in, like right, Colorado threw the ball a lot, and I, I heard earlier you mentioned that this OC likes to run the ball, um, but there's already a crowded backfield at SDSU, so I feel like recruiting wise, it's gonna it's gonna kind of be more like when I came in, where it was kind of like looked at San Diego State always put out some good receivers. Um, I feel like this guy kind of gives you that feel just by the look of his offense. Um, so like, and also tight ends, you know, we've always had really good tight ends at SDSU. So I think, I think, I think you'll see, a, see more of that with, uh, you know, just with the guys he recruited at Colorado. Um, and just, just like, like I said, just the way, just the way he runs his offense, he always has four guys, four receivers on the field. Um, there was rarely a time where I seen less than two. Um, so I think I just, I don't know. I, I liked, I liked where he's headed. All right, all right. I know we're going to get into some actual X's and O's talk maybe the later on this week with our, our coach, Coach C. We like to break down some of that film. I have to ask some of you guys' opinions on that as well. Coach Freddie, tell us a little bit about, because we didn't even jump into Montgomery High and the work that you guys have been doing out there. You know, I, one of the main things I've really been wanting to have you guys on, man, you got to respect Got to respect the high school coaches out here in San Diego, man. The the grind is real. The work you guys do with the young guys out there in the South Bay is uh, is commendable. You know, I, I'm down here in the South Bay now myself, uh, so I try to make it out to some games down here and and just check out what the what the scene, what's going on. So tell us a little bit about what's going on in Montgomery, man. Well, uh, this is uh, next year would be our seventh year at Montgomery. Uh, me and Demarco have been there the entire time together. Um, it's a, it's definitely a challenge, definitely being on what you call the west side of Chula Vista, which is uh, the west yeah. of the five, compared to the east schools being brand new schools and parents wanting to send their kids to those brand new schools. Um, those schools are also packed with over 4,000 students each. Uh, Montgomery holds about 1,700, 1,600 students at the moment. Um, and it's coaching the guys that are there. You know, being able to develop guys that, that, that can get out there and play for you. We do have uh, kids leaving on scholarships every year. More of, We have one, since we've been there, we've had one D1 guy who's at I, uh, University of Idaho. Um, and the rest of them are, are D2, D3, and NAIA guys. Uh, but it's the opportunity to give them the ability to, to believe in themselves and, and, and use football to get a degree and use football to build relationships. Because if you don't, football will definitely use you. Yeah. That's vital, man. The, the, the lessons you guys are, are bringing to their attention now, I mean, that's, that's lifetime lessons, you know, and that opportunity to go to, to any college and get that education. Awesome, man. Respect that for sure. Yeah, yeah. What's uh what's the outlook for next year, man? What do you guys focus on most on, on improving? Well, uh off for well, for the offense, uh, you know, we just gotta have we gotta be more consistent. Um we got into a lot of games where we started off consistent, then we had lulls during the game, and then you know, some games we didn't we weren't consistent at all. Um on top of consistency, uh, our conditioning, like you said, playing fast, you have to be um, a very conditioned team. Um, and then, but at the same time, you know, we also coach track. So that's that's um, one of our biggest keys to building up these these young men is that mm -hmm. get them on the track, you know, every day on the off season, weight, weight room, track, weight room, track. Of course, seven on seven is gonna be in there. Um, we're gonna do a lot more seven on seven this year 
um, just to get our receivers and quarterbacks, running backs, you know, our secondary, just to get them more looks and just get them more season. But uh, I think the biggest part is is being on that track and, and staying conditioned all year and, you know, keeping those, keeping that core strong all year long. Man, I wish we had the track team still at state. <laughs> oh, I know. Everybody always says that. Everybody always says that. I know. Yeah, that um, going back on the track home, and I remember when uh, we had Coach Kraft there, we would get go do uh, track workouts with uh, Coach Sheffield, uh, mm-hmm. who was track coach. Um, and it looked like on uh, with track with Kraft, he was trying to go after you know to build his fat, uh, build speed. Um, and for, obviously for the game, how the game has changed, it's all about speed. Um, and then when uh, Chuck got there, Chuck Long, um, it was about getting big. You know, how big can we get? Um, so we went from going from a speed program to we just needed to get big and large. And uh, you're still strong, but I think at that point it was just too big. As far as me personally, you know, I went from being a 215, 220 linebacker to almost pushing 240, and I just couldn't play at that level. You know, it was too much weight all right i'm seeing in the comments ec preps you guys and ed martin the basketball coach do wonders there i cover east county sports and have seen what you guys have done there at montgomery the program there so people people are noticing man people are taking taking notice for sure with the work you guys are doing down south francisco says montgomery high has the best principal in san diego <laughs> Dude, he's also a, a former Aztec football player uh let, yep. uh Zoomstein, Louis Zoomstein, played football at San Diego State as well. Um, he's all about the program. Um, one thing, you know, you asked me about being a head coach. It's about the the, the, the school, the buy-in from the admin, the ASB, the athletic director, the, the, the people on the front desk and the admin department. It all matters. And so, you know, with this hire, I hope that the university and, and the fans understand that it takes everyone's involvement to mm-hmm. move program along it's not just hire a head coach and he's going to be the guy as you know i talked about before the nil and and everything that's going on with that on top of you need the administration and everybody's involvement to move the program along or you're gonna it's gonna be a stalemate Mm -hmm. that's awesome point that's awesome point you know definitely with this hire it's gonna need aztec nation to get activated we're gonna have to we're gonna have to show up you know gotta gotta get those tickets gotta show up Got to got to get there early and be loud and turn Snapdragon into a a home field advantage because whoever this coach was gonna be definitely needs our support and like you said it's not just about the coach it's about the supporting staff uh, everybody else around it that makes it go makes it happen yeah yeah definitely last question for you guys because it's a big one you guys are in the high school ranks you guys are are seeing the recruiters you know you guys are seeing the landscape. To me, high school football in San Diego, I mean, it's thriving. It's growing. It's, it's getting a lot more media attention, a lot more prominence here in town. So in your guys' estimation here in San Diego with this hire that the Aztecs have made, I mean, is this going to help more kids stay at home, be likely to stay at home? I'll let Freddie. You go, you go ahead, Freddie. <laughs> um, it, it depends. It depends. You know, it's, it's – when you, uh, we went to an event this year where they had the former alumni come by and, and the, the Isaac Legacy alumni come by and kind of put you through a practice and, and talk about recruiting and, and where the program's headed. Um, you know, and they explained it to where, you know, if you're trying to, if there's one senior linebacker graduating, you know, they're trying to find one linebacker in the entire country. You know, so, yeah, we, we all want them to pick San Diego guys and we're San Diego kids and we want them to do that. But, it, you know, on their board, they could have four, five, six, seven linebackers from spread out throughout the entire country before you get to that to that student athlete that's in San Diego. Um, so I, I do kind of understand that part, but I'm also biased as well, knowing that, um, you know, San Diego does have great football players. And uh, not only that, but they have a bond with the university. If you can catch these kids, they want to be Aztecs no matter what, then I would focus my time on those kids. You know, I would ask them, hey, if we offer you, are you an Aztec? And if you're not, then we'll move on. You know, and uh, I think that would also help with the NIL deals and all that because they, a kid wanting to be from San Diego wants to play for San Diego, wants to play for his hometown. And if transferring won't look too good upon you 
when you return to San Diego, because believe me, you're going to return to San Diego. You're not going to stay at, you know, uh, anywhere in Ohio or Michigan or Wisconsin or wherever. You're coming back to San Diego. Um, and so uh, your roots built here goes a long way. Yeah, I, I agree with that, man. I think um, if it's like close, I think they should always lean towards the San Diego guy just because the, the football here is so good. Um, I, I would always err on the side of bringing the San Diego guy back home. Um, but as you said, you know, not not everybody, not any, not every high school kid is going to want to stay home. So those ones that want to leave, you just got to, you know, wish them luck and maybe you'll get them in the transfer portal. But I, I agree with you. That's a, a big thing is guys that want to go to San Diego State and maybe there's a guy close, maybe a little above them that you have on your board. You know, you might want to take the chance on the kid from San Diego State more often than not. Mm. Yeah. Well, we oh, go Building the stadium is that all, their whole entire family is going to be at the game. You know, it's a, it's a community that's going to come watch the kids from his high school coaches to his youth football coaches to, you know, middle school teachers. They're all going to be involved in knowing, hey, I want to watch the San Diego State game because so and so is playing and we're going to support them. We, we also got to play the guys from San Diego. <laughs> I mean, we had two guys from San Diego this year. Um, I didn't see I didn't see too much of them. Lucky Sutton and then uh, uh, Christensen from uh, Madison. I've seen them. I've seen a lot of them late. Um, but I mean, to to let a guy like Roderick go to Georgia without even you know, without even trying to persuade him to stay, and then we let Washington go to New Mexico State the year before before he left. So I just think those are two quality guys that you know we didn't even go after. And I understand what Freddie's saying, like. There's all these kids around the country that 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 they're looking at, but at the same time, we have the we have those good high, good um, quality kids as well, and I just feel like I mean I, I feel like they're not even we're not even giving them giving them a, a chance to say no to San Diego State. I, I, I think I think that should change. Well, hopefully with the new hire, we'll see. Uh... We'll see if some good things are coming on the horizon for, for our local guys, man. Got to build those ties stronger. Well, I want to thank our two athletes for life here in the set. I'm so Guys, uh, keep up the hard work. Awesome job. Appreciate a lot, it. A lot of Castle Park support out here. A lot of Castle Park support out here. All right. <laughs> thank you, guys. Yep. Freddie, DeMarco. Let's keep up soon. Let's do it again. We appreciate you guys' time. Thank you so much. Right, no, no problem. Thank you. See you guys. Okay. There you have it, guys. Let us know in the comments if you guys appreciated those uh, those interviews because, you know, we got to show some love to our to our high school, especially our, our Aztecs for life down in there. Okay. He's back on. I see him. He's back. San Diego <laughs> State, baby. Yes, sir. What's going on, Dan? Did you, uh, did you, did you have a nice little nap? Nice little cat now. Yeah, I had to take a break, man. Yeah, too much good interviewing going on there. No room for me here. <laughs> okay, let's get back into the chat. Thanks again, to Freddie and DeMarco. You guys are awesome for coming on. Okay. Hmm. How are we feeling about this, guys? Because moving forward, okay, we got we got a different uh different coach, some different staff coming in. There were some players though that have entered the portal. I'm thinking of Cameron Harpool. I'm thinking, of course, Mr. Avenger uh, and a few more. I mean, uh, some people have been asking, okay, are they going to make a U-turn now that they saw now that they saw Coach Lewis is coming? Uh, I, I don't know if that's going to fly necessarily. I mean, uh, you know, all the best to to all the guys that, that are continuing their journey elsewhere. And, you know, of course, all the seniors. Can't forget about the seniors. I mean, they put in all, all these years here on, on, the, on the Mesa. But I'm excited for what's next. Like the guy said, you know, the, the recruiting here in San Diego. I think this is a move that San Diego State can get. Obviously, us fans can get excited about. But I do think it does kind of galvanize the, the local community. You know, I think just just the mix up out there in Colorado gave like what you're saying, Dan, this this hire has splash on the national scene. Now people are going to want to see, OK, what what is Coach Lewis doing out there in San Diego State? What is he gonna do out there? How do you think uh, how do you think it's gonna gonna fit in coming out here to San Diego? Oh man, I think San Diego 
or Southern California was meant to have a fast, high scoring team. Like, I mean, that should, that should be like, it should fit like a glove, like get speed out on that, on that grass, snap drag in, making plays, running quick. You know that they very like 99% or 90% of the time they hide it before the, the, the play clock gets down to 20. I mean, just think mm. of that pace. I mean, um, that, it's going to be like really fun to watch, man. And uh, I think that it's going to be such a, a difference in what uh, other people saw when they would go to the games before. You know, it's going to be the exact opposite. Now, that I don't expect him to come in and um, all of a sudden we're a 10 win team. I think there might be some growing pains, which we could talk about. But um, for the most part, I think just the brand of football and, and his energy uh, will captivate Southern California. Or San Diego, I should say. Yeah, I think uh, the football culture in this city, especially, is so ingrained with you know the Don Coriel, the high-powered offenses, the Ernie Zampezi, um, you know those high-flying offenses. I, I think that, it, like Dan said, a kind of hand-in-glove kind of thing. It's like the perfect fit. Um, and and we we haven't really hired an offensive guru at the school and. Uh, man, since Don Coriel, pretty or probably Al Luganville. I'm sorry, Al Luganville is probably the last one. But Chuck Long, he wasn't really an offensive guru. He just happened to be the co-offensive coordinator at Oklahoma, and he was friends with Jeff Schemmel, and <laughs> that's how he got hired. So it's not like he was some bright, young, brilliant offensive mind that they brought in to, to bring his offense to San Diego. It wasn't like that at all. Tom Kraft, he was an offensive mind, but at at the junior college level, you know, he had never coached beyond that other than being the offensive coordinator at San Diego State for a couple of years. Um, so this is like the first legitimate, like nationally recognized offensive guru that we brought to this program. And I don't know how long, man. So I'm, I'm excited. It's going to be a lot of fun to see what happens. OK, OK, OK. I'm seeing in the comments. Ooh. I agree with DeMarco. Got to give SD kids a chance to say no. I mean, I think with this hire, it does give you that ammunition to go after. For, you know, you got to you gotta take your shots, go out there, go after the, the top kids locally. This offense is going to give that opportunity to where you can go out there, reach out there, and go after the, the biggest names locally. But I like what you said, Dan, too, is that it's like the system, the system, you know, the fast pace. That's going to be attractive to to everybody, and you don't necessarily need the the highest because it's that it's that scheme that is going to be able to uh, you know get the job done. Hopefully, I mean, I kind of stayed quiet on the San Diego recruiting because for me it's a, it's kind of a touchy subject hmm. because the the kids they don't take heat when they go to Michigan or they don't take any heat when they go to Georgia if San Diego recruits them. But the day that we don't recruit them or we don't pursue them as hard as they want. We got to hear from all the coaches and and whatnot. You know, um, it's a two way street. We'll offer some, and some will come in, and some we won't offer, and they'll go somewhere else. It's just, I mean, they want to get out of town, and sometimes you know what? They may not even be a fit for San Diego for whatever reason. Yeah. I do expect Roderick Robinson um, to not go to Georgia. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, or Julian saying I saw that in there to not go to Alabama. I mean, at what point is it a waste of time to also waste all the resources as well? You know, going after the untouchables. I feel you. I feel you on that. You you want to you want to focus in on what's going to be a best fit for what you're running and the culture you're creating. And if you don't have a realistic shot, I I get you in. Hmm. I mean, there's only there's also there's only so many hours in a day, man. Like you yeah. can't recruit everyone. And these kids that you know you don't have a shot at, and they may even told you that you don't have a shot. Honestly, <laughs> we won't ever hear that on the outside. But they could have given them a heads up. The high school coach might even give them a heads up. You can't spend your wills. You got to go find players. I mean, um, so you could you put out some feelers, see how um, you know, see what the response is. But at the same time, they have a job to do, and they got to get the players to the system. And they don't really owe anything to San Diego and the high school coaches. No, that's a, that's a good perspective, I think. That's a good perspective. Okay, so let's see. What, what's been some of, the, some of the talk out there? What should be the realistic expectations coming in? I know, like I said, tomorrow is the official announcement tomorrow morning. Can't wait to hear it. 
to to hear from from his mouth, you know, the vision he has for San Diego State and and really the defensive vision. I think a lot of people uh, are curious to see moving forward. What are we going to do with, on the defense? Are they going to really change things up? We've been running a three three five for so long. How is that going to flow? But uh, what, what should be the realistic expectations in your mind, James? You know, when it comes to you know us Aztecs fans who who think we should be undefeated every single year, right? Do, do some of us Aztecs fans think that? Come on, come on! I don't think we ask for that. Uh, I think they should be a bowl team next year for sure. Um, I think they should be able to compete for the Mountain West Championship next year. Um, you, you may say like, oh, he's, that's crazy talk or whatever, but I mean, it's not like they got really blown out this year other than Air Force, and that was just a that was just a, a cluster of a game. Um, so they, they were in all their games this year against the, the two teams in the championship game. They should have beat Boise. They had Boise beat at home and UNLV they didn't play this year. So it, it's not like they're that far off from being a, a contending team in the Mountain West. So I, I don't think that's, you know, obviously if, if they don't win the, you know, if, if they're not in the top two or whatever, the Mountain West, it's not a disappointment. I think a bowl game should be what we're looking for next year. Hey, Matt, and I, th- I don't think it's fair if we don't bring up, you know, his his defensive failures at Kent State. I mean, they're really poor defensive teams. And you got to think about, you know, is it because of the type of offense they run, it's going to put a lot of pressure on the defense? Um, or was it the lack of athletes that he was able to recruit there? Um, so that it's going to be interesting – not not necessarily for me, like on the defensive coordinator, but just how whoever you bring in as a defensive coordinator, how is that defense going to adapt to what they're running on offense? I mean, you may not ever get a top 50 defense here just because how our offense is ran. And maybe we got to get used to maybe a little higher scoring games and not as good of a defense. I mean, that's going to be a struggle at first, especially conditioning wise um, on the defensive side. Yeah, no, I think that's, it's that's perfectly valid. Yeah, I think it's pretty fair to say, well, as long as he's here, we will never have a, a top ten defense again. Um, I think I think that's a pretty fair guess to say. Just to, like Dan said, the nature of the offense, and I talked about with Demarco, it's like, and and Freddie, um, that puts so much pressure on the defense for your offense. Even if they score, they're scoring so quickly, the defense doesn't get to rest, and then if they go three and out, they it burned like 30 seconds of time, 30 seconds of clock going three and out. So yeah, it's it's gonna be tough on the defense. And even if we have a really good defense, they're they probably won't get the recognition that, that they deserve because of just the nature of the offense. Yeah, you, you explained it better than I could have about even if we do have a really good defense, the stats might show otherwise. Totally, totally. And, you know, the, the more possessions that the opposition is going to have with that offense, for sure. Well, it, it's it's something to think about. And I, I hope it is something that Aztec Nation realizes because, I mean, the nature of this style of play it is going to be higher scoring. But, I mean, if that's what you guys want to see, that's what the fan base has been asking for, right? Points, throwing the ball, running the ball, points, 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 you know, something exciting. Uh, this is a this is going to be a big attempt at that, at exciting. So butts need to be in seats <laughs> you, know, you know and that and that's um you, you know that type of offense is you know you, this is where you think about what type of um strength and conditioning coach you're going to get in you know what type of athletes are you going to want are you are you are going to more you know the smaller defense that's going to be able to play the, play a lot of the game and um be have really good st- strong conditioning so that's going to be a, an interesting one of who's he going to bring in and on the strength and conditioning side yeah, just just sheer number of plays. We're going from like 50 to 60, 70 plays a game to now we're going to be looking at 80, 90, close to 100 plays a game just because of the nature of the offense. So just the sheer number of plays are going to be so much higher. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be that, that's actually probably a pretty big hire that nobody's talking about is a strength and conditioning guy who he brings in. Okay, Eddie O says, Arnett, Arnett, Arnett. I know we were talking about Zach Arnett. And hopefully, maybe the, there's a connection there. We could bring him back. But who knows? Like you guys said, the scheme you may not want to run that defensive scheme with that offense. Of course, Syracuse tried it, right? The kind of a similar type of offense running with Rockies 335. Hmm. 
SD sports being kind of similar to what we're seeing in basketball this year, where it's a lot more scoring, whereas last year it was it was a, a lot slower pace. And this year in basketball, it's, it's free-flowing. We'll talk about that some of the time, though. <laughs> I saw his question. I saw his question earlier about um, he mentioned – uh, the West, Co- like how JD Wicker said he wanted someone with the West Coast ties. Yeah. Um, but when he did say that, he also added like context to it, saying that's just part of all the things we're looking for. You know, I'm not sure what he even considered West Coast ties. Is, is coaching at Colorado a year considered West Coast ties? Like, no one really knew what that meant in general. Um, but I think maybe that could have been a check against his hire, you know. He had to be real convincing in that interview, I tell you, because what Wicker was talking mid December, and we're not even in December yet, and we got this high. I mean, this was way sooner than what I expected, guys. Of course, there are a lot of names that they interviewed that didn't make it out public, and I'm sure we'll probably hear them now. Of course, I think we heard Ryan Grubb was interviewed. I know that was on like a lot of people's list. That was my that was on my short list for sure. But this has got to give you a lot of confidence. It gives me a lot of confidence knowing that they made this hire as soon as they did. I, I think he really must have nailed that interview. Hey, hey, real quick. What, okay, I got a question for you guys. What do you think his his annual salary will be? <laughs> I'm going to say uh, just a wild, egg, wild ass guess. I'm going to say 2.2. So I think that is that the highest in the Mountain West. I I think think it's either right above or right at, yeah, something like that. Might be two point four. I can't remember, but yeah, Um, I'm I'm kind of curious. One thing I was thinking about is I think if that issue with Dion doesn't happen, um, we may not even have a chance at him. Um, You know, say they just keep scoring thirty two points a game like they had been, even though if they lose, whatever. Dude, that guy's. We probably don't even get a chance. He's there. There might be better options, like you know, schools that could pay more money. So we can. It might be a like a good thing for them to have a difference in opinion and kind of for him to be demoted. Kind of adds into just the swarm of probably good feelings that they had about this hire, like the perfect time, perfect place, perfect situation. Despite you know whatever West Coast uh, hardcore ties maybe are, aren't there. I mean that to me, I'm not so hung up on that, right? Um, and yeah, the the highest paid uh, Mountain West coach going kind of backtracking a little bit is Craig Bull, Wyoming. I think he's like two two point five. I see you, EC Preps. I, I looked that up as well. So yeah. 2.5. So I, I think uh, I think we'll definitely be near at the top of that. I mean, you you, oh, you want to save as much money as you can for the coordinators, you know. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you got to pay going right r- rates and living in Cal and living in San Diego isn't cheap, you know. And so it's, yeah. it's a lot more expensive than living in Wyoming. <laughs> Correction: 2.337 million. Correction: Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, it, it's gonna be interesting. I, I don't, I don't, I don't waste too much of my my thought process on that. I mean, if they make the hire, they make the hire. It's a done deal. I, you know, I, I just want to support the guy and support the program. Well, people me. people talk about it. Yeah, it's almost like um, you're doing more for the program if you pay a guy more, as opposed to finding a good coach that you that you could pay less, right? And you, mm-hmm. you think your your budget would be better, but overpaying looks like you're more committed to winning. For whatever, for what it's worth. Mm, there, down goes, down goes James. Down goes James, man. Dude, that was a quick one, too, dude. He just vanished. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll see how quickly he can get off the mat. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Bro, oh, there, he's back, back with the back with the quickness. Look at you. What a fighter. What a fighter. You're a champion in my eyes, James. Champion. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay all right no I, i'm super intrigued about this hire guys it, um you know i think it kind of answers a lot of, a lot of questions we have on on moving forward you know what type of uh what type of offense we're gonna go for everything i think marketability wise i'm a, I'm a big guy on on how are you gonna market this team i mean when when you hear this guy talk it's all energy i, I don't i don't think there's any doubt you, you you're gonna get behind what he's saying, you're going to want to pull 
for the guys to win. And, and, and man, he's going to get you hyped up. That's for sure. Hey, Matt, let me also add this. Okay, so this is – we always talk about stadium production and whatnot. You can't have bring this guy with the energy he's going to bring, <laughs> the team, the style of play he's going to bring, and have a dull environment in there. You can't. Oh. <laughs> That's like, um, you know, you just can't. You got to – the product has to match, you know. Like, you know, people are – you can't have this quiet, dull stadium with no production whatsoever, no energy, and then have try to get this team that's trying to run up and down the field. No, I hope he brings it, man. I hope I hope he stresses that. You know, we got we got to put this thing together because he he's a he's explosive just in his personality and just you hearing him talk. I mean, you're right. They, you know, we've got to we got to match that. We got to increase that and make a, a real home home field environment, man. We got to do it. Got to do it. He's gonna be like he's gonna be gold on radio interviews, television interviews. He's gonna be the exact opposite, you know, of really of Rocky and Brady. Um, it's gonna be. It's for me. It's gonna be refreshing. It's gonna be a little more fun. And yeah. um, man, I can't wait to hear him on the interviews. Can't wait to hear him for the press conference. I mean, yeah, thirty-seven I mean, years old. Think of that, man. That's so young. Yeah, it's great. We were talking about uh, you know the other candidates, and we brought up Marion from UNLV. He's thirty-six, and this this was his first FBS gig. Versus Sean Lewis, who's thirty-seven. And he's already been a head coach before. He's already been a, a power five offensive coordinator. All the experience he has, and he's only 37, man. So this is like yeah, uncharted territory for San Diego State. You got a, a, a young guy who's already done it. He's got a lot of experience, and I think it's a big deal. Also, uh, is he the most imposing head coach you've ever had here before? Yeah, I was thinking six, seven, man. I, can't, I couldn't believe that when I saw <laughs> Oh, uh, I get it. When I've Oliver. heard, like, when I've heard like his interviews and how he introduced himself to the 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 team at Colorado, it makes you want to play for him, right? It kind of like it makes you ready. It makes you it gets you amped. It gets you ready to play. And then, so I can't can't wait to see how it rubs off. And 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 when you real quick backtrack a, a while back, you had mentioned our transfers. Mm. To me, it's it's. Like, I don't know if these kids, especially that are lower on the depth chart or really minor contributors, know how impossible it's going to be to find a roster spot at even at the G5 level next year. You know, when you when you haven't been a big contributor, I thought it was crazy that they they entered their name in the transfer portal without at least seeing who was going to be hired and see how the fit is. Now, Harpole, I can understand he's a tight end. I don't think we'll use tight ends as much. But Josh Nicholson, I mean, I would it's at least crazy. wait. The, the transfer portal is going to be, I mean, if you thought it was crazy last year, it's it's just only going to get even more, more crazier. So, no, I hear you. It's it's not easy. I mean, we've talked about it from the beginning when the, when the portal kind of got established. And it's like football is not the same as basketball where you can just kind of plug in and play. I mean, football, you got yeah. so many different variables, so many different spots on the team. You just hope, hey, hope they land some land, you know, somewhere, and and you know, God's plan is as everybody likes to say. But I think last year it was fifty percent of all like the transfer portal portal students um, didn't land at a different school and like at that same oh, level, you know. So it's I I, 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 I know they're not listening, but man, they got to be careful. I would have just made sure if they, I would have first seen if Sean Lewis would honor their scholarship first, you know, at least, you know, you have that, but man, I guess it's a race to the portal too. Cause you, you gotta get, you gotta find a team before other people do. So it's interesting dynamic. Real quick, Grizz, he's saying, you know, about coach, coach Lewis, he learned from the best marketing person in the world. Prime time. He made over 300 million in revenue in one season. I hear what you're saying, but I feel like the way things went down in Colorado, I feel like Coach Lewis, he's like, didn't want nothing to do with that. I, I You know, I mean, when you really look at what was going on there with, with Prime, I mean, you got them, you know, flashing the jewelry, selling everything. I mean, it's so in your face, so much bravado. And I, I'm a fan of the bravado, but it's just when it comes to that whole world of NIL and the marketing, and, and I mean, some of it was just so – so over the top i'm not so sure 
that uh, Coach Lewis is <laughs> is, is uh, going to take it to that level. M maybe some of that, maybe, maybe a, a tad bit, because he, he is an excitable guy. But I, I can't see, you know, any of those elements coming over to San Diego State. That's what makes money. I get it. I get it. I get it. Okay. Maybe in, in the best way possible, you know, it, it helped that mark marketing of, of, uh, of the program. Womp Rat. Coriel was 37 when he started coaching at SDSU. Yes. And I made this point earlier when we were talking about Marion. And, uh, yeah, I, I see you guys. Some of you, uh, Oliver Lee, we don't get the go-go offense. I know for a split second there, I was really excited about the possibilities of Marion and that go-go offense. He's 36, only a year younger than Coriel. But in this situation, what makes me excited, like what you guys are saying, I mean, Coach Lewis is only 37. So you get that youth factor in there, and he's already got head coach experience. Like that is that is so huge to already have been able to put together your own staff, have guys that you know trust you, you could put together your own staff and you can lead. Uh that I mean, that's that experience is pretty, pretty huge. Huh. And dude, and another thing to think about, I mean, there's room for growth, right? Like he's on a yeah. finished product, he's still young and you know, maybe finding a better way to make sure the defense and the offense mesh a bit, you know, will help out. Or he'll learn from his experiences in Colorado as well, you know. So he's he has a – I think he still has a, a high ceiling. Hmm. Eddie, oh, what Lewis might have learned from Prime is how to recruit and attack the transfer portal – which could be absolutely pivotal for a rebuild at SDSU. I think uh, I think we all agree on that, that transfer portal. Yeah, I think that's J why JD put the emphasis on making this hire as soon as possible is the transfer portal and the early signing period. And I, I think that's going to make it interesting to watch. Really, San Diego State hasn't really dipped into the transfer portal all that much. So it, it'll be interesting to see if they, they do it more this year under Lewis. And going forward under Lewis, um, that'll be something to watch and see. You know, I, I imagine there might be some guys from Colorado not happy that decide to come over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's also, I mean, a good way to get, you know, some transfers is, especially initially, is when you hire your assistant coaches, right? They have connection with some of this, these kids at the schools that they're at. Um, you know, so we'll see what happens there. You get that initial kick. EC Preps, we have two years to get this as the college football landscape is changing starting next year with the 12-team playoff as that starts. Yeah, there's no, no lies there, man. No lies there. This is uh, – the, the landscape is changing right before our eyes, of course, as, as we harshly learned. But, uh, you know, there, there's still that opportunity to get in the playoff. If we can make things happen. This is, this is uh, the most important hire moving forward, as as Kirk Morrison said. And uh, I'm curious to hear what Kirk thinks about this hire. I hope he was involved. If anybody got, if any of you guys heard his interviews on 760, you know, he was asking to be involved. I believe they they did connect, as he said, uh, with JD. So that was a uh, definitely something I, I loved hearing loved hearing from uh, Kirk Morrison. So I'm I'm interested to hear what he has to think. And then one one other thing, you know, one of the one thing that drove, I guess, James and I crazy, maybe you too, Mateo, is, you know, like rotating the running backs five deep, you know, and like spreading all the carries. When I was looking at the la the stats these last two years at Kent State twenty two and twenty one, they had a they had a, a, a whore, dude. They had had a, a guy that had fifteen hundred yards or twelve hundred yards rush, you know, the ninety bear as well. Pardon me as I switch, switch my, switch my face here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that too. It, it seems like he has uh, one main back that he sticks with, and then the other guys kind of like change of pace or just break backs. So I, I kind of like that too because that would just drive Dan and I crazy. Is the the rotating backs in every drive? You, you know, guys kind of need to get in the rhythm. A guy like Armstead. That first series against San Jose State, they ran the ball with him exclusively, and they go right down the field and score a touchdown. And then the next drive, he doesn't even go out there. 
So stuff like that drove me crazy this year. And I'm excited. This guy, he's Coach Lewis seems like he's more of a, a, a main back guy. And then he's got spelling backs to, to get the guys a break, his main guy a break. Okay, I'm I'm hearing I'm seeing a lot of Danny O'Neill. Danny O'Neill, the three star quarterback signed with CU. He probably will come to us as Grizz says. Grizz, thank you for your participation in the chat this evening. Really appreciate it. Hmm. Whoa, whoa. I think that's uh that's something we definitely want to see. Some quarterbacks. So, you know, I, I'm interested to see the quarterbacks we have on, on the roster already. You know, how is that gonna jive that? A lot of things to look out for tomorrow. A lot of a lot of good things. Hmm. He was a you top candidate it. for Michigan State, according to CBS. I don't know about that. Maybe. I think like um, Crum may fit in that system pretty well. I don't think Leo does because he's just not a he's not a runner, you know. Um, but yeah, so I'm kind of curious to see if we'll we'll get some kids transferring out from offense, especially on the quarterback side, just from the system itself. Mm. Yeah, such a big change, such a big change. Yeah, and the system, I, I don't know if you got a chance to watch any of the, the Kent State film or – I mainly tried I, – I tried to lean more on the Kent State film because it seemed like the Colorado stuff had more input from the other coaches on the staff. Um, at Kent State, they did a lot more uh, read option type stuff, um, a lot of power option. So that's really cool. I like. I'm a big fan of power running. So, running that power play out of the, the shotgun is, you know, that's the best way to still run the ball when you're a spread team. So I'm excited to see that kind of stuff come. I've been wanting it at San Diego State for years, and I think we're finally going to get some of that stuff. It's not the triple option stuff I was excited for with the go-go offense, but it's still some kind of option um, with some power running spread in. To that spread offensive attack that he runs. So I'm, I'm excited for that. All right. All right. Seeing you guys here in the chat staying strong. Appreciate you guys for being here. Make sure before you leave, you hit that like and subscribe button, guys. We're going to be here doing plenty more updates on this new hire. I mean, this is a, this is a huge day for Aztec Nation, guys. I mean, new stadium. First new hire for this new stadium. It's uh it's a big one, and we gotta support. Gotta support for sure. Whew. Okay, guys, you guys ready for this press conference tomorrow? I'm not sure what time, how early it's gonna be, but I am ready for it. Do you think they'll have the microphones working from the um <laughs> for the reporters? From the reporters. <laughs> We're gonna be able to hear the questions, maybe. Yeah, you think we'll be able to hear the question? <laughs> Gonna, I, bet, gonna, I bet we can't, dude. Honestly, that's what's gonna. And I'm way pissed. You're gonna try to get over there, Matt, and try to bully your way in with no press pass. <laughs> <laughs> show, show my credentials. Be like, what are your credentials? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm like, uh, bam. Uh, I don't know. Can, they me, can can I get me in, guys? Can I? No, I doubt it. It'll probably kick me out real quick. Um. <laughs> No, no, I'm just excited. I'm excited. It's a great day for Aztec Nation. It's an exciting day. You know, um, I'm just glad we got the oil can back. And now we got a new coach moving forward. Got that oil can. I don't have to hear Fresno State, none of their business anymore for a whole year. I feel pretty good with this coach, though, guys. It wasn't on my radars as we opened the, the, the show saying it was on James' radar, so he gets the credit for that one. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, plenty, plenty more to learn about Coach Lewis in the days to come. Yeah, tomorrow's going to be a fun day, man. That press conference and then the days after, listening for the updates on the staff. we got a yeah, fun two weeks coming up. Ooh, and then the, trans the, the signing day here in a couple a couple weeks, and then transfer portal. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a really fun offseason. And then you get to the spring, you get to see the, just the new regiment in there. All right, it's good to hear. It's good to hear, guys. No, no real off season. There's no real off season now, guys. <laughs> With basketball season getting the full swing, football has got a lot more activity. It's it's an exciting time. All right, anything else before we shut this thing down? I know we're still getting some getting some chats here, but let's see. Hmm. December 9th basketball game for his intro to the fans would be amazing. Thank you, Braden Neeks. That absolutely would. December 9th, I believe that is. Uh, Against UC Irvine, 
And uh, that's already going to be a well attended game because they're they're pretty solid this year. That'd be an awesome, well, that's a great awesome idea. Game. Yeah, yeah. I was that was back when I had season tickets for basketball, and I was there when they uh, announced Brady the first time, and that was a cool experience being there for that. So yeah. if you're not already going to the basketball game, that's a, even more of a reason to go. Is I'm sure that's going to be the day they do it. Mm-hmm. I will be there, and they're handing out these little. Uh, Final Four replica banners. So, yeah, it's going to be crazy. SG Sports Fiend, I'm so happy you guys can smile again. What do you mean? We were not smiling in none of our episodes before? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> no, Dan with his Kill Me Now name tag he had every week. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, take me out of my misery. <laughs> mm, okay, CJ619, Isaiah Buxton, three-star corner from modern day catholic decommitted a few weeks ago from u of a and sdsu has recruited him it would be a good get all right Let's see what take happens that, take that note down take that note down yes James, you work? Have... yeah i work in about <laughs> i leave in about 45 minutes <laughs> <laughs> i've hardly been able to sleep all day because this news broke and yeah, so I'm gonna be struggle. I'm gonna be on the struggle bus tonight. No sleep, no sleep. Let's go. <laughs> no sleep. <laughs> the theme music. <laughs> In the chat, all you on YouTube, all you at Sons of Montezuma, Sons of Montezuma.com for joining us. I know the season is over. And, you know, I hate that it's over because I really enjoyed the season, no matter what the outcome was. We had a lot of great times at the tailgate with many of you, of course, connecting on social media with many of you. Uh, Definitely keep supporting our seniors. A lot of the NIL guys we have this holiday season have their items for sale still. So definitely do your part and support the guys. You know, no matter what the outcomes were, the games, these guys are Aztec Warriors and, uh, you know, they gave all that they had so dirtball dan k5 james thank you for joining us thank all of you guys in the chat make sure you hit that like and subscribe button so we can keep doing more things eddie oh it's not over it just started i get it i get it i know <laughs> the the journey continues and uh we're, we're we're very pleased that all you guys are here with us on this journey all right until next time guys go as six stay tuned to the press conference tomorrow all right let's go Throws intercepted. Marcus Ratcliffe picked him off, and he gets tackled by Malik Sherrod. Behind Maiden. Maiden's keeping it. Maiden gets around the edge. He's got nothing but green grass. Jalen Maiden. Touchdown, Aztecs. Armstead with a push in the back, and he breaks the play. His first kick tonight from the right half. And no problem. Career high four field goals for Brown. Maiden wants to throw. Maiden caught. Touchdown. Leo Kemp, the first of his career. Brady Hope going out with a win. And the old oil can is coming back to San Diego. Hey, before we get too crazy, you gotta give Coach Game Ball. Yeah.